Hello, and welcome to episode 3 of our open online course for Einstein Summation Convention. Today, we're directly building upon what we started in the previous video, looking at further ways we can use the Einstein summation to denote particular concepts. This video will be a little bit shorter, where we consider the scalar or dot product in relation to Einstein's summation. So, without further ado, let's begin. Some of you may already be familiar with the concept of a dot or a scalar product, but let's recap it in full, just in case this concept is new to you. Consider two vectors, A and B. They can be of any size, so long as they are both of the same size. So, for our standard example, let them both be 3D vectors. A is equal to A1, A2, A3, and B is equal to B1, B2, B3. What if we applied an operation to these two vectors where we multiply together the corresponding element of each vector and add together each product? So that sounds a bit confusing in words, but let's have a look at it this way, with this denoting a dot product. So A dot B is equal to A1, A2, a3 dot b1 b2 b3 which is then equal to a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus a3 b3 so you're multiplying the top numbers and adding it with multiplying the middle numbers and then adding that to multiplying the bottom numbers to give you the whole result there on the right hand side we can easily write this using sigma notation if you're unfamiliar with sigma notation don't worry it won't be necessary to understand it for this course. A1, B1, plus A2, B2, plus A3, B3, is equal to sigma from the sum of i equals 1 to 3, AI, BI. As you can see, this part looks exactly like a pair of tensors multiplied together. Einstein's summation convention states that we can omit the sigma and retain the AI, BI. So, in Einstein's summation convention, we have a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus a3 b3 is equal to ai bi. The most important thing to note about ai bi is that it is a scalar. Can you understand how we started with a first order tensor or a vector and turned it into a scalar? Consider what we're doing to each element of the vector in your explanation. This fills a gap in our notation from the previous episode. We now know that if an index appears twice in a term, then we apply the dot product for that term. There are two basic cases for this. 1. When we have two distinct tensors, AI, BI. As we've already seen, this equals A1, B1, plus A2, B2, plus A3, B3. And the other case is when we have one distinct tensor, for example, AII. This might be slightly less obvious, but AII still results in three components. These components are AII is equal to A11, A22, and A33. We can see that this works for second order tensors. Let's briefly have a look at a compound example. AIBJ, CIDJ. Is this valid? By our definition that an index can appear twice in a term, then yeah, it's fine. It is valid. Both I and J appear exactly twice. But what does it look like? Recall in the last video that we compared a product of two first order tensors, AI, BJ, as having similar properties to that of a second order tensor? Well, the same principle applies in this instance. If we regroup the term to look like this, of a first bracket with AI, CI, and then BJ, DJ, then we can apply the dot product twice as follows. A1, C1, plus A2, C2, plus a3, C3, and so on. And if we expand out the brackets, you can see that we have nine terms to the scalar. So, AI, BJ, CI, DJ hold very similar properties to the product of two second order tensors, such as AII, BII. Finally, it's just worth noting that, in Einstein's summation convention, a term with an index that appears more than twice holds no meaning. For example, AI, BI, CI doesn't mean anything, as one cannot apply the scalar product to three vectors. It only works for two of them. That's all for episode three. Here's a brief recap of what we have covered in this episode. We've defined a scalar, or a dot product, for a first order tensor, 
or a vector. We've applied the properties of the scalar product for use in Einstein's summation convention. We've distinguished the use of the scalar product for a term with one or two tensors. We've applied compound scalar products to terms with multiple pairs of indices in them. We further outlined the similarity and properties of terms with different products of tensors and tensor orders. And we've also outlined further situations where equations do not make sense in summation convention. If you're having any trouble answering any of these questions, don't be afraid to have another look over this video or have a look at our course notes for the episode. We also encourage you to have a go at some of the questions related to this video so you can practice with what you've learned. Good luck! And we hope to see you all next time.